God. Thank you, guys. Oh, my gosh, it's so great to be here today. And I'm so glad, Pastor Sam, that you, you feel like we are Canadian. Because I was telling the ladies last night, you can have a seat. Um, I feel way more Canadian than I do American. You know, Minnesota is literally connected to Canada, you know. And so I tend to apologize for everything. Isn't that your national slogan to say, I'm sorry? Yeah, okay. So anyway, I'm, I am Canadian in that sense. So um, we love you guys. We love Toronto. We love your city. We love your church. We love your pastors. But you guys need to know that what God's doing here is really unique. You know, the Apostle Paul, when he t would visit different churches in Scripture, he would always talk about what he saw in those churches. And he would actually talk about what seeing other churches did in him. And he's like, I'm so strengthened, I'm so encouraged by the faith that I see in you. And between last night and even this morning, the passion, the enthusiasm, the faith that I see in this church, the youthfulness, the diversity, like you guys have to know this is a move of God. I was telling the team last night, this is not normal. God is not even doing this in New York City right now. Like, what God is doing right here is so rare. It is so unique. You guys are a forefront church. So I just have to say, it is an honor to be able to even be here. It's an, I'm learning from you. I'm inspired. I'm like, I want to take this church home. You know what I mean? Like, I want all of you to be in my church. So anyway, we love you guys. Um, I can't wait. Let's just jump into the Bible, though, okay? So get your Bibles out. We're going to jump into Exodus chapter 15 this morning. Um, the past couple months, my husband and I, we've been reading the Bible with our teenage son. You know, as a parent, like, I can tell him to read his Bible, but it's a little hard for him to do it on his own. So we sit down at the table together, and we read scripture, and then we process it, and we talk about it with our son. And so we've been going through the book of Exodus, and I love reading the Bible. And so as I'm reading Exodus, no matter how many times I've read it, there's so many things that you're like, I didn't see that. That's new. That's fresh. And so right now, we're going to talk about a story that happened right after the Red Sea. So just to give you a little bit of context, in the Old Testament, God wanted to deliver the Israelites. They had been slaves for 400 years in Egypt. And so he, he had Moses as their leader, and he said, you need to go to Pharaoh, and you need to say, let my people go. So Moses goes to Pharaoh, and Pharaoh has a hard heart. He's like, nope, I'm not. So then what does God do? Ten plagues. you got to read it. It's crazy. It's so insane. There's so much significance with the ten plagues. Finally, the Israelites get to leave. But then they come to the Red Sea, and God does the mega miracle. He literally parts the Red Sea. A million people walk through on dry ground. The, the Egyptians come afterwards chasing. The water falls on them. They die. Like, it's the craziest story. In fact, um, right now, like, scholars literally um, have an estimate of they know in the Red Sea where the Israelites walked and where they crossed, and there's evidence of chariot wheels, like, gilded to the floor of the Red Sea. Like, they can see it as a historical fact. So it's just kind of fun to know that we're not just talking about Bible stories. Like, we're talking about something that happened in history. And if you keep reading your Bible, there's something about the Red Sea miracle that, like, always they attributed to. Like, everyone goes back to the Red Sea. Everyone goes back to the Red Sea. And God did something so significant. So, the story we're reading is right after the Red Sea, okay? So, read with me Exodus 15. We'll have it on the screens. Verse 22. Then Moses led Israel from the Red Sea, and they went into the desert of Shur. For three days they traveled in the desert without finding water. When they came to Marah, they could not drink its water because it was bitter. So it wasn't safe to drink, right? That's why the place is called Mara. So the people grumbled against Moses, saying, what are we to drink? Then Moses cried out to the Lord. And the Lord showed him a piece of wood. And he threw it into the water. And the water became sweet. There the Lord made a decree and a law for them, and he tested them. He said, if you listen carefully to the voice of the Lord your God and do what is right in his eyes, if you pay attention to his commands and keep all his decrees, I will not bring on any of you the diseases I brought on the Egyptians. So he, he's talking about the plagues, the diseases. For I am the Lord who heals you. Then they came to Elam, where there were 12 springs, and 70 palm trees, and they camped there near the water. Now, on the surface, as we look at this story, it's just a simple story where it's like, it seems like God is teaching them. He's training them. This is how you trust me, okay? Yet, unfortunately, the Israelites, their faith muscle was pretty weak, so they're failing the test. And I think it's important to know that God's goal was not to bring them to a bitter place. 
God's goal was not to bring them to a place of no provision, but he wanted to bring them to a miracle place. In fact, the only reason why it's called Mara, bitter, is because they didn't trust him. In fact, it actually should have been called the sweet place. The Hebrew word for the sweet water there was called yimtiku in Hebrew. And that's actually what they should have called it because what's crazy about that word in Hebrew, yimtiku, sweet water, it actually has a double meaning and it actually also means intimacy, tight knit. Like God wanted to like have a bonding moment. Like, yeah, you think this is hard? Let's bond. I want to give you sweet water. Like I want to have intimacy with you. It should have been like, oh, God, you shouldn't have. Like, after all that you did, I mean, you did the plagues. You brought us through the Red Sea. You sent us off with gold and silver and lots of plunder. And then this, you know, like, that's what it should have been. But instead, it was a moment of complaining, of grumbling, and a lack of faith. So let's look at verse 27 again. It says, then they came to Elam, where there were 12 springs, 70 palm trees, and they camped near the water. Now, I, I think it's important to point out some of the numbers here. Like, whenever you see numbers in Scripture, they're not just there to be boring, okay? Like, there's always significance with numbers in Scripture. So when you see 12, 7, or 10, they actually have meaning to them. So 10 is the number of testing. 7 is the number of perfection, completion. In fact, the word Sabbath actually comes from the number 7, from the word for 7. So 70, 70 palm trees, or yeah, 70 palm trees, is literally the perfect amount. God is saying, hey, like, I am giving you the perfect amount of palm trees, 70. Like, complete. Like, God is into crazy details. Not 69, not 68, 70 palm trees, right? And then, not only was there fresh spring water for them, which they needed water, so he saw what they needed, but he provided 12 springs. One for every tribe of Israel. Like, how organized and planned out and detailed is that? God had them on a path. God was taking them somewhere. Again, I don't believe God leads us to bitter places. I believe he wants to lead us to miracles. But we make them bitter because of our response. Instead of crying out to God, we like complain. So instead of crying out to God, God help, we complain to God. God, where are you? You did this to me. Instead of humbling ourselves, we're grumbling. And even then, God was so grace, grateful and grace-filled because what did he do? It just took one person's faith. One person's faith, Moses, just crying out and saying, God, help. And boom, God has mercy. And he, one person's faith brought them to a place of completion. So for you and I today, it begs the question, what do we do at Mara? When we are in bitter seasons, how do we respond? And one way to ask and to find out today is, what are the bitter things in your life right now? And how are you currently responding to those things today? Because the truth is God is still testing us for promotion. Not because he's cruel, but because testing is the only way to find out, A, if we have the character to even handle the blessings that he has for us. A lot of people fail to realize that every level of blessing requires a new level of character. God knows if he just gave us everything we wanted, we wouldn't even appreciate it. We would just become entitled brats, right? Do you know what I mean? So often our windfall can actually become our downfall. So we always say at Substance, like, listen, we tell our people, don't pray for promotion, pray for promotability. Don't pray for money, pray for the character worthy to steward finances. If you're single here today, don't pray for a spouse, pray for the character that's worthy of a spouse. Because you always say a, a content single person is a content married person. But if you're discontent in your singleness, you will be discontent in your marriage. We always think there's something elusive that's going to satisfy our needs, but I'm just going to tell you today, it's God alone. Our soul finds rest in God alone. Because listen, at the end of the day, the question is not, does God want to bless you? Of course he wants to bless you. He came to bring life to you. He's not the one that's stealing, killing, and destroying. Jesus came to give life. He longs to bring us to a place of completion. He longs to bring us to Elam. But we've got to trust him when we're in those bitter spaces. Those bitter places that he can turn them into sweet. And I'm telling you, I've just watched God turn so many bitter places into sweet ones that I actually get kind of excited. I know that sounds really weird. But whenever hardship or trial comes, I don't, I don't go, oh, man. I'm like, oh, oh God, 
What are you going to do? What's the miracle that you want to do? How do you want to reveal yourself? How do you want to show yourself in this situation? So when I come to a Mara moment in my own life, it's like, okay, Lord, where's the piece of wood? Like, where, where, and, and that symbolizes what's the act of faith? What's the act of faith that you would have for me to do that is going to bring about the miracle that you want for me? So, like, I'm not even going to let a Mara situation become Mara. So when I get that offensive text, which I just got one, like, a week ago, I was literally, like, I got the most offensive text from a dear friend of mine. And, it, and I was like, nope, nope, nope. I am not going to be offended. I am not going to let this steal my joy. I am not going to let this. I'm going to give it to the Lord, and I'm going to watch him turn this bitter text, this bitter offensive thing, into something sweet. Like, listen, we have a choice in how we respond. Despair? Not today. I am not going to allow despair or discouragement or bad news trouble me. I'm not going to say, why God? I'm going to say, Lord, what are you doing? For what purpose? What do you want to grow in me? How do you want to reveal yourself? Not just to me, but to my kids, to my congregation. And that's what I love about C3. I Honestly, you guys remind us so much of our church like 15 years ago. Like when we, we were young and just like portable and like I just love that God's given you this building we were at a place where we would do seven services in four locations they were all portable we went 11 and a half years without a building so I mean like it was hard for us to get a building in Minneapolis St. Paul and so I'll never forget there was this downtown historic church that was right next to our football stadium and it was gorgeous and we always wanted to be in our downtown we always wanted a historic building it's just cool it's just powerful it's just fun to be a part of history and so what was crazy about this church is they needed a pastor and we needed a building. So I was like, win, win, you know, 1600 seater. It's just, it's gorgeous, gorgeous, worth millions and millions of dollars. The only issue with the church was they had about 180 people in the church, um, but 98% of them were over the age of 80. And, you know, our church was 98% under the age of 25, you know, and so, um, it was kind of awkward, you know, like they loved organ music. And let's just say, you know, we had DJs and rap music in our worship, you know. And so it was like, how is this going to work? You know, it's kind of like we were that 20-year-old that's dating the 80-year-old millionaire. You know what I mean? And everyone's like, yeah, I don't see it. You know what I mean? And, you know, you're kind of like, yeah, but, you know, I'm sure the 80-year-old was really good looking 50 years ago, you know. And everyone's just like, yeah, no, no. So... Listen, the church governance was a little messed up, and, and so ultimately after nine months of dating this church, trying to make it happen, we just realized it's not going to happen. And I'll never forget, we had to walk away, you know, so we broke up with Grandpa, you know. And, um, <laughs> and how many of you guys know, like, when, when you have a tough situation, like, when it rains, it pours, right? And I just think it causes us to, again, we can either get more stuck. And, and usually when it rains, it pours, and hardship kind of piles on top of each other. One of the tests that we're going to experience is what I call the jealousy test. So right around that time, some pastor friends of ours acquired a building in, in Los Angeles, and it was a downtown historic church. So, of course, Peter and I are like, dang it, how come they get a building? Like, we tried so hard, we prayed, we fasted, we prayer walked, and it didn't happen. And then these guys just get a building. It's kind of like you're trying to get pregnant, and it's not happening, and then Fertile Myrtle cranks out 30 babies, and you're just like, what? You know what I mean? You're trusting God for a promotion, you're working really hard, and then your dork friend who has no skills gets a promotion. You know, I mean, am I the only one that, like, feels this? You know, so it's like... So Peter had to go to, to L.A., and he he's actually was visiting these pastors, and he gets to tour their historic church. And, of course, it's gorgeous. And, at, you know, and, and he gave me permission to share this, but he's like, as he's touring it, like, jealousy is just stirring up. Like, this is not fair. I can't believe it. I can't believe they get this church. Like, what the heck? And remember, it was a Mara moment. But Mara can only become bitter. It only became bitter because of their response. So in that moment, Peter found himself like just jealousy, bitterness, resentment, anger, even anger for the governance of this church back in Minnesota, anger for their old ways, like they wouldn't modify. You know, I mean, it's, I'm just being honest. Like you start, you know, hashing things in your brain. You start ruminating over things. And so all of a sudden, Peter had this sense, like the Holy Spirit literally told him, I want you to actually give a large sum of money to this church. If you want to reap a building like this, Peter, then you need to sow seed into this building. 
And of course, Peter's like, no, like, ah, uh, hello, like, Substance doesn't even have a building. Like, we need the money desperately. Like, you have to understand, at that time, we had like 1,700 people coming to our church, and only 80 people were giving money. 1,700 people, only 80 were giving any money of any kind. And our daughter, who was eight years old at the time, was one of our top givers. And she had given $80. And it was all of her birthday and all of her Christmas money. And she was one of our top givers as an eight-year-old. So, like, our church had no money. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, it was one of those. And yet, the Holy Spirit's like, Peter, this is a bitter moment for you. This is a Mara moment. You're dealing with jealousy. You're dealing with some frustration. What should your response be? What's that piece of wood you're supposed to throw in? Give money. Sow seed into another church. Sow seed into something that you're trusting God for. So Peter had the thought, I can't expect a harvest if I'm not sowing any seed. If I want an impossible downtown building in Minneapolis, then I've got to help somebody else with their impossible building. So he did it. Gave them some money. And you know what's really fun? These are pastor friends of ours, but we, we were like acquaintances, not good, good, good friends. I don't even think they knew we gave them money. Like, they, we never got a thank you. Like, and I wasn't, but I'm saying that to say we didn't do it for prestige. We didn't do it for the thank you. We didn't do it to even increase our relationship with these pastors. Like, I don't, I don't think the finance person ever told them Substance gave you a check. It was an obedience thing. It wasn't about being recognized. It was like, no, no, we're doing this for us. We're doing this for our heart. We're doing this for our pain, our frustration. We're trying to not be bitter in our Mara moment. We're trying to actually sow seed. And Does that make sense? And you guys know the rest of the story for us. We shared it last year when we were here. But, like, we got a building in downtown Minneapolis that's a historic church that's 139 years old. It's crazy. And if, they're, if that's not even crazy, in the same year, we went 11 and a half years, no buildings. And then in one year, we get a downtown building and we get a building in the suburbs. In fact, I've got a picture here. You can kind of see the two different auditoriums, our historic and then our suburban. Like, our assets went from like nothing, to 41 million in one year. And that is not because of Peter and I. <laughs> that is because of the Lord and our faithfulness to sow seed. Our faith is what turns bitter into sweet. Our response is what turns Mara moments into miracle moments. So my question for us today is what if your current setback is actually a setup. What if your current downfall that you're truly legit feeling right now is actually your windfall? That God's like, just, just wait, just watch. Like, I'm setting you up. But here's how you know if your faith is actually active. Look at your generosity. I would say generosity is the gas gauge of where your faith is at. So you think about gas, it can run low. So like, we don't just give once. We fill up our car all the time, right? So we have to continually look at generosity. And I'm talking about generous with your finances, but also generous with your time, generous with your forgiveness, generous with your emotional health, being generous with understanding people, covering over offense, being generous with how you talk, with your thoughts, even generous, we could keep going, okay. Listen, even Jesus said in Matthew 6, don't think that you can trust God with your eternal soul if you don't trust him with your money. And Matthew 6, Jesus said, you cannot serve two masters. You cannot serve God and money. Where your treasure is, there your heart follows. So who are you trusting today? Who is actually your master today? You know, just this last week, I was in a meeting with one of our long-term church members. He's actually a board member in our church. Him and his wife are just incredible leaders. And they were telling me a story of 12 years ago. So they were like, Pastor Carolyn, we just have to tell you, 12 years ago, we were sitting in the row, fifth row at Substance during a Sunday morning. And they're like, we had heard of tithing. We knew about it. We believed in it. We were mostly consistent in tithing, giving 10% of our income to God, but giving it th through the local church. And so they knew about it, but let's be honest. They're sitting there in the seats, and that week their tithe check would have been $350. And as the offering's going, they were like, it's too tight. It's too tight this week. We, we, we actually need that money in our own bank account. And so he's wrestling with God, and he's literally like, eh, should I give it to the church, or do I keep it in my own bank account because I need the money? And all of a sudden he felt the Holy Spirit just convict him, like, do you trust me? 
and, and how can, and felt like the Holy Spirit said, how can I trust you with more money? Like, if you're not willing to give. And honestly, that's the same question for us. We want God to bless us, but how can he trust us if we're not, if we're just hoarders of money, if we're hoarders of wealth, rather than conduits of wealth? Conduits? Like, everything we get from God is his, and we steward and we give. Right? And so he just felt like the Lord said, how can I bless you if you're going to bow down and worship the blessings? Like, how do I know? If you want favor in your life, you got to be a conduit for my kingdom. So, in the service, him and his wife, they wrote out old school. This is 12 years ago, so there wasn't digital giving. You know, they, like, literally wrote a check and for $350. Put it in the offering, but didn't just put it in the offering, like, prayed. Like, wrestled. That's what God's looking for. He's not looking for money. He's looking for our heart. He's looking for our faith. He's actually looking for that wrestling moment. God wants to wrestle with you today. He wants you to actually have a moment with him where you're being honest about your, I do believe, but help me with my unbelief. I know a truth, but man, help me obey the truth. Do you know what I mean? And so in that space, they were like, okay, God, here's our, here's our $350. We, we trust you to supply all of our needs according to your glorious riches in Christ Jesus. Crazy, that month. He brought in a record commission check. He actually got a $35,000 commission check, a hundredfold his tithe check. It had never happened to him before, and it had never happened in the history of his company, and none of that business was in his pipeline. Like, it, none of it was leads that he had. It was all new leads, all within days of him writing that tithe check. And his, as he sat this week at, at my table in my office, he just, they just looked at me like, we'll never forget that story. Like, that's a history-making moment for him and his wife that were like, $350, we're going to trust the Lord, and then look what the Lord has done. So if I could summarize the moral of our Bible text today, it would be this. Even in your bitter moments, let's learn to flex our faith. I love what Psalm 145, 8 and 9 says. The Lord is gracious and compassionate. He is slow to anger and rich in love. The Lord is good to all, and he has compassion on all he has made. And I'm telling you, church, if we could just let this sink into our soul, I'm telling you, we would know the God of miracles instead of the grieving at Mara. Some of us, we just, our life, you, if, I tell, if, you t if I hear your story today, it's grieving at Mara. And God wants you to know the miracles. He wants you to know the miracles that he has for you today. I just want to end with a story today out of church history. It's, it's one of my favorite stories. So I was actually a history major in college, studied British history, Irish history. And, and so one of the stories comes from the 1700s in England. I'm sure you guys have heard of the movement of the Methodists. But it started with John Wesley in England. And in those days in England, you had the Anglican church. And so the Anglican church was filled with very dignified, wealthy people. So if you were wealthy, if you were dignified, if you were educated, if you were a politician, you went to the Anglican church. The Methodists were known to be a little more crazy. They actually did contemporary worship. They did small groups. And, and they were more focused on our sermons are actually going to make sense to normal, everyday people. You know, So you kind of had these two different church movements happening in England. And so it was very rare for anyone that was wealthy or influential, politically elite, to ever be a part of the Methodist church in the 1700s. But there was one wealthy woman in the 1700s who was not afraid. She was a spitfire. Her name was Lady Huntington. Have any of you guys Downton Abbey fans? Anyone? Okay, it's a little old, but uh, my, my phone ringtone is still Downton Abbey. Like, I just love the show so much. I'm that old school that I just keep that ringtone. But anyway, um, and you know how today nobody calls, right? Everything's text. And so, like, then when I do get my phone, it's Downton Abbey. Like, I don't want to answer my phone. It's just so pretty. The music is so great. Anyway, okay, so it, Downton Abbey, just think like the Dowager Countess, you know what I mean? Just this old aristocratic lady. Like, that's, okay, we're, so, you know, we're talking, okay. So the Lady Huntington Super wealthy aristocrat. She's friends with royalty, with actors, with politicians, influencers. Yet, she was a passionate follower of Jesus. And she wasn't afraid to speak her mind or risk her reputation. And hilarious enough, she actually enjoyed chewing tobacco. Is that not funny? Like, very not ladylike for the 1700s or probably any time in history. Okay. Um, but despite her wealth, she experienced some crazy hardships. She really had some Mara moments. When she was 39, the love of her life, her husband, died of a stroke. Total tragic. Now she's a widow. She's got four little kids. To make matters worse, after her husband died, 
two of her sons tragically died of smallpox. I mean, just talk about crazy. And in those days, losing a son could literally, like, it, it, losing a husband, losing sons, it's your economic future. I mean, it's just intense. This is life-altering for her. Here's what's interesting. Instead of growing distant to God, she actually pulled closer to him than ever before. And she actually just, in that moment of loss, and what could have been bitterness, she just realized, man, my wealth, the, the meaningless of earthly success just became so clear to her. She's like, and so she had this crazy idea. What if I can advance the gospel? What if I could have a significant part in history of helping the gospel of Jesus Christ move forward? Well, she happened to be friends with this up and coming preacher named George Whitfield. George Whitfield was a firecracker preacher. And so she went to George and she said, George, if I throw a party, would you come and actually preach at my party? And so George was like, what kind of party are you talking about? <laughs> and so she's literally like, I'm going to bring parliament, I'm going to bring lords and ladies, I'm going to bring actors, writers, I'm going to have a private party, and I want you to come preach. I want you to tell them about Jesus, share the Bible. And he's like, hey, I'm willing to do that, but I am not going to hold back. I am not going to water down the gospel. I'm not going to take out parts of scripture. She's like, no, 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 I want you to go for it. And he's like, okay. Wouldn't you know, the Prince of Wales literally shows up. The half-sister of the king shows up. Like, it's this crazy, and they're mesmerized by George Whitfield. They're mesmerized by the story of Jesus and scripture, and, and they've never heard this before. So Lady Huntington is like, hey, you got to throw another party like this. So they kept throwing parties where she'd throw a party, she'd invite all of her influential people, and George Whitfield would preach the gospel. And so this divine partnership of Lady Huntington and Whitfield began to grow. In fact, historians actually credit this as the moment that the educated elite started now flooding into this new model of church, this model of church, the Methodists, where they're singing contemporary music, they're preaching messages that are practical, they're doing small groups, so versus this stoic Anglican church. But just like you'd expect with any move of God, anytime they're taking forward motion, let's, let's preach the gospel, all of a sudden there's opposition. People hated the fact that George Whitfield was preaching the Bible. They hated the fact that he would actually talk about sin and call out sin. People started organizing protests. They literally started coming and throwing dirt, eggs, rocks, anything they could do at George Whitfield. In fact, there was two guys that actually did an assassination attempt for George Whitfield. So he's experiencing this. Lady Huntington, she started experiencing even more hardships. She actually, her youngest son, who now is 15 at the time, was suddenly struck with blindness. And then three years later, he dies at the age of 18. If you look at Lady Huntington's life from an earthly filter, it just was tragedy after tragedy, death after death. In fact, by the end, like she ended up bringing, she ended up having seven kids. Five of her seven she buried because they died tragically. Yet, Whitfield and Lady Huntington were not about to back away from the gospel. They did not get bitter. They're like, we're all in. In fact, when it's tough, we're going all in even more. What do we have to lose? So then Lady Huntington had it on her idea, like, come on, let's build the church of the future. She kept thinking, what if we constructed churches that were actually attractional, that actually met the practical needs of people? So this is kind of weird to think about, but back then, there were zero comfort creatures. You know, of course, they did not have coffee. They did not have bathrooms in churches, and they did not have kids ministry for churches in the 1700s. So she's like... This is not working. If we want to bring people into church, we got to do simple things. Bathrooms, kids ministry, coffee. I mean, are you hearing me? You know, so she started building these really innovative churches, you know, which we think is just normal today, right? But she's like, what if we actually give a rip about what people need? And of course, guess what? This time she gets critiqued for it. But guess who critiques her? Christians, you know, it's all, oh, of course, you know, there's always that religious elite that were like, you, you're spending too much money on a building. Like, what if that money could be used to help the poor? And instead, Lady Huntington was so smart. She's like, no, 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 I know that for every church building I build, we're going to reach so many people. And the money that people give is going to launch so many ministries. We're going to reach more poor people through having innovative church buildings. Are you hearing me? So she became one of the general contractors for hundreds of Methodist churches in England. 
so she's just on a mission. Like, I am not going to let hardship or bitter moments stop me from being on the mission of God. I'm going to go all in. So in the meantime, she's, she literally, she's doing this. She just sends Whitfield, hey, America is a mess. America needs you. There's 13 colonies. You go start preaching to America. So she sends Whitfield to America. In fact, Whitfield preached so many sermons to the 13 colonies that one historian argued that four out of every five colonists had experienced one of Whitfield's sermons before he died. Isn't that crazy? So you've got impact in America, you've got impact in England. By the time Lady Huntington died, she had overseen the construction of 116 Methodist buildings. In fact, Whitfield was so impressed by her management skills and her faith in God that when he died, he left all of his money to Lady Huntington. Like, how crazy is that? He knew the greater investment the greatest investor on earth isn't a man, it's this woman, Lady Huntington. And, and, and listen, by the time they both died, their partnership in ministry resulted in over 10 million people giving their lives to Christ. Like our building in downtown Minneapolis, it's historic Wesley. It's connected to the Methodist church. And, and so our building would not exist had it not been for George Whitfield and Lady Huntington. Isn't that crazy? And I just think, but, like, I think what inspires me about Lady Huntington is that she wouldn't let bitter moments ruin her life. She didn't sulk. She wasn't a victim. She just turned, she just trusted the Lord. She went all in, all in. And I just, I don't know about you, but I want that to be said of you and I. God wants to do something new. The people in your city do not know God. They do not have hope. They do not have peace. They are, they are medicating themselves with every addiction possible to just even cope and make it through the day. They do not know God's word. They do not know the life, the light, the hope that they have. We may be the only follower of Jesus that your coworker or your family members or your neighbors ever meet. I'll never forget being at the University of Minnesota and I had a college professor. He was Jewish and he was from New York City and he was being a professor in Minnesota and he had never met a Christian before. And he literally like kind of poked me, like not meaning mean, was like, are you for real? Like, can I touch your arm? Like, are you, I've never met a, a Christian. I've never met someone that believed the Bible. And I remember just thinking, I'm his first. What, what example am I to Professor Richard Abowitz? You know what I mean? That's the world that we're in today. And I'm telling you, God wants to do something new in us. He wants to teach us through his word that he is not leading us out of slavery through the desert to bitter places of no water. He's leading us to Elam. He's leading us to palm trees, to sweet water, to miracle moments. But we have to trust him. We have to surrender our faith to him. So let me pray for you today. It's time to go all in church with your faith, with your resources, with your time. What are the bitter things in your life right now? How are you responding? Let's do business with God. God, you see every person in this room. You see them, you love them, you know them deeply. Would you help us? We are crying out to you. We are surrendering ourselves to you and we're saying, we do believe, but help us with our unbelief. Help us in these bitter moments to trust you for the miracle that you are working in our lives. God, we want to see miracles. We want to see provision. We want to see our family, our neighbors, our coworkers, our kids, our grandkids experience life to the fullest. But it starts with us. Would you work into us what is pleasing to you? We commit ourselves to you as a church. In Jesus' name we pray. Church, if you believe that, say amen. Amen. I love you guys. Thank you for letting me be here. Pastor Sam. Amen. Amen. You can uh, bow your head and close your eyes. And ultimately, every one of us are faced with the core of every faith question, which is, do I trust God? So with your head bowed and your eye closed, I want you to take inventory of your heart.
And we don't let a single service go by without giving you an opportunity to fully trust God with the salvation of your soul, to fully trust God with your whole life. And the way we do this is we pray a prayer of faith that invites Jesus into our heart and it makes our heart right with God. We, we accept what He did on the cross. What Pastor Carolyn's preaching in terms of living a life of faith, stepping out in faith, being generous in faith, that all comes after giving your life over to Him in faith. And there might be two different people in the room. There might be the people that have never made that decision before. And I wanna give you that opportunity to make that decision, to make Jesus your, the Lord and Savior of your life and to place your faith and your trust in Him. Or the other kind of person might be someone that's made this decision before and has responded like this before, but for any number of reasons, which really don't matter right now, you know that your life isn't right with God and you want to recommit your life to God. You wanna re-invite Jesus into your heart. And if that's you with every head bowed and every eye closed, what we're gonna do is in a moment, I'm gonna ask you to raise your hand as a response and I'm gonna acknowledge it before heaven. And it's a way that you, can, that you can say, God, I wanna pray this prayer. And then as a whole church community, we're gonna stand up and we're gonna pray a simple prayer together. And it's a prayer that's gonna make your life right with God. It's a prayer of faith. So if that's you, with every head bowed and every eye closed, if you've never made a decision to invite Jesus into your life as your Lord and Savior, or you've once made this decision, but you know that you need to recommit your life, with nobody looking around. Could you raise up your hand so I can see it? Thank you, up the back. Thank you in the middle, I see it. You can put your hands down. Is there anybody else? Today's the day. You need Jesus. You gotta place your faith in Jesus. Is there anybody else here today? You're like, yep, that's me. I wanna join these two people. Amen, amen, amen. Praise God. Why don't you stand to your feet all across this room and let's just, let's just praise God for it that incredible sermon and what a challenge to, we, we, we're, we're always in our lives straddling between living for ourselves and making us the master or completely placing our faith in God. And uh, I, I know you would agree with me at the end of that message and that impartation that what, it's really not a choice, is it? I want to give my life for Jesus. I want to live my life for Jesus. No holding back. Amen? Amen. Listen, two people are having a life-changing moment with God and their story is colliding with the story of Jesus and they're, and they're inviting Jesus in their heart and, and Christ knows exactly why you lifted up your hand. And so we're going to join with them and we're going to stand with them in prayer. Amen? And so just repeat after me. Say, Dear Jesus, I thank you that you died on a cross for me, forgive me of my sin, make me new right now and help me follow you as my Savior and my Lord in full faith from this moment on. In your name, Jesus, I thank you that I'm saved. Amen. Come on, give God some praise. So good.